Welcome to the Jesus Trip. I'm your host, John Crowder, and this is part two of 10 in our Consuming Fire series, where we are diving into the heartwarming topic of hell. I'd encourage you to watch these in order to make the most sense of where we're going. Now, to discuss hell as some abstract place or state of being or metaphysical torture chamber is actually not to talk theologically. Theology is the study of God. But I think there is a properly theological way to address hell. And it is, for me, the only correct way to discuss hell. God is hell. This is the main view of the early church fathers and is still held widely by millions of Orthodox believers today. We'll call it patristic hell, okay? That we all ultimately go to the same place, the presence of God. You're going to love it or initially you might just hate it. But the same fire lights up heaven and hell, it's the fire of God's love. Now, today's video is a remix version of my God is Hell teaching from some years ago, because my views have evolved on this. You know, there's this dualistic notion here in the Western world, and by that I mean separation thinking. God is over there, we are over here. That leads to a radically unbiblical concept that hell is separation from God, as if anything can exist outside of Him. God is the ground of all existence. Jesus Christ is the sustainer of the cosmos. Hell is not some sovereign, independent domain outside the kingdom of His grace, where evil endures indefinitely into the eschaton. We'll get to that later. But for starters, when God is spoken of in Scripture, it is overwhelmingly in terms of fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Isaiah 33, who can dwell with a consuming fire. Christ comes to cast fire upon the earth, and oh, that it were already kindled. The disciples, on the road to Emmaus, when He opens the Scriptures, their hearts begin to burn. The Spirit comes in tongues of fire. Holy Spirit, God's own self, is the fire of Pentecost. He makes His angels, spirits, His ministers, flames of fire. And here's the thing. All of us face the fire. Your magic sinner's prayer is not about avoiding the fire. All of us will be salted with fire. Again, as Jesus opines, oh, that it were already kindled. But this is the cleansing, healing fire of His loving presence. And if you dread it, then you need to get your head on your shoulders because it is the last thing you would ever want to fizzle out. This fire of the love of God is the very bliss of the saints. Does it purify? Yes. Is it healing? Yes. Is it justice? Yes. Is it mercy? 100% yes. But by no means is this some retributive payback scheme. We are called even now in this life to get acclimated to this fire, not to retreat from intimacy and vulnerability and love like Adam hiding in the bushes. This is a flame of purity. It's not legalistic, not vendetta. It is a curative judgment against sin itself, which in our baptism we recognize we've already died to sin in Christ. We're talking about the white-hot love of the Father for His children. We're talking about restoration. If exposure is ever involved, it is for healing, not for shame, not for suffering. He is the liberator from such things. But no one escapes His presence. His Spirit was poured out on all flesh. When Romans 8, 9 speaks of anyone who does not have the Spirit, it's not referring to Baptists and Democrats. Look, have in the Greek is echo. Clearly, not everyone is echoing with, resonating with, aligning with, walking in the Spirit of God. But the Spirit is poured out on all flesh and is at work in every single human being, even in our resistance to reveal and conform us to Christ. So to cast God in terms of Himself being heaven and hell, one thing we must remember is the issue of perspective. As a number of great saints have noted, hell is heaven wrongly received. Heaven and hell are 
our human terms for trying to describe what it's like to be in His presence. Either it will be bliss or torment for those who either accept or refuse love. Daniel saw a river of fire coming from the throne. The psalmist, on the other hand, saw it as a river of pleasure. Ezekiel and John see it as a river of life, bringing life wherever it goes. The Israelites, when they looked upon Mount Sinai, they saw fire on the mountain and they shuddered in fear. Fire on the mountain, run boys, run. But when Moses looked at it, all he saw was a cloud of glory and he walked right into it. Same place, two different perspectives. Gregory of Nazianzen in the fourth century writes, God himself is paradise and punishment for man, since each tastes God's energies according to the condition of his soul. But this is just bringing us to the objective reality of our true condition in Christ. Gregory knew Jesus assumed our human state in order to bring us into his. He writes, by Christ's suffering, all of us, and not one, but not another, have been restored. All of us who participate in the same Adam were deceived by the serpent and killed by sin. And all of us have been saved by the heavenly Adam. But a wrong relation to this flame is not eternal. It is limited in duration. If duration is even the word to use, eternity is outside of time. Christ harrowed hell. He emptied it. As Gregory says, I believe thou will bring forth hate from Hades as many mortals as it has imprisoned. But this flame of love is experienced in a twofold way. Isaac the Syrian, he writes, The power of love works in two ways. It torments sinners, even as happens here when a friend suffers from a friend. But it becomes a source of joy for those who have observed its duties. For me, I say that those who are tormented in hell are tormented by the invasion of love. What is there more bitter and violent than the pains of love? Those who feel they have sinned against love bear in themselves a damnation much heavier than the most dreaded punishments. The suffering with which sinning against love afflicts the heart is more keenly felt than any other torment. It is absurd to assume that the sinners in hell are deprived of God's love. Love is offered impartially, but by its very power it acts in two ways. It torments sinners, as happens here on earth, when we are tormented by the presence of a friend to whom we've been unfaithful. And it gives joy to those who have been faithful. This is what the torment of hell is, in my opinion, remorse. But love inebriates the souls of the sons and daughters of heaven by its delectability. Isaac says that it is blasphemy to think God tortures people forever. He said it is not the way of the compassionate maker to create rational beings in order to deliver them over mercilessly to unending affliction and punishment for things which he knew even before they were fashioned aware how they would turn out when he created them and who nonetheless he created. Thomas Merton says it this way. He says, Our God also is a consuming fire. And if we, by love, become transformed into him and burn as he burns, his fire will be our everlasting joy. But if we refuse his love and remain in the coldness of sin and opposition to him and to other men, then will his fire, by our own choice rather than his, become our everlasting enemy. And love, instead of being our joy, will become our torment and our destruction. Now, it is imperative to know that the fire itself, which is God, is eternal but it's not eternally perceived as Gehenna to us. He is eternally opposed to evil, but what is destroyed is the evil within us that opposes such love, and evil is not eternal. Our false and fallen identity, which has, again, objectively already been dealt with in Christ, cannot outlast the love of the Father. Only God is spoken of in Greek as being properly eternal, and thus that which he eternalizes. Peter Kreep, 
a Catholic philosopher, says, in reality, the damned are in the same place as the saved. In reality. But they hate it. It is their hell. The saved loved it. And it is their heaven. It's like two people sitting side by side in an opera or a rock concert. The very thing that is heaven to one is hell to the other. Dostoevsky says, we are all in paradise, but we won't see it. Hell is not literally the wrath of God. The love of God is an objective fact. The wrath of God is a human projection of our own wrath upon God. As the Lady Julian saw, a disastrous misinterpretation of God's love as wrath. Crete says that it is like angry children misinterpreting their loving parents' affectionate advances as threats. They project their own hate onto their parents' love and experience love as an enemy, which it is, an enemy to their egotistic defenses against joy. Since God is love, since love is the essence of the divine life, the consequence of loss in this life is loss of love. Though the damned do not love God, God loves them, and this is their torture. The very fires of hell are made of the love of God. Now, that's a Catholic philosopher. Let's look at the Orthodox perspective. Metropolitan Harithos Vlachos, explaining the Orthodox view, he writes this. He says, The general teaching of the Holy Fathers of the Church is that paradise and hell do not exist from God's point of view, but from man's. It is true that paradise and hell exist as two ways of life, but it is not God who created them. In the patristic tradition, it is clear there are not two ways, but God himself is paradise for the saints and God himself is hell for the sinners. He says this is inseparably linked with the teaching of the fathers about reconciliation and man's enmity toward God. Nowhere in Holy Scripture does it appear that God is reconciled with men, but that Christ reconciles man to God. Moreover, it appears in the whole patristic tradition that God is never opposed to man, but man opposes himself to God by having no communion and participation with him. Thus, man makes God his enemy, and God does not make man his enemy. Through the sin which he commits, man sees God in an angry and hostile way. In other words, Jesus, uh, Paul never says that Jesus is dying to reconcile an angry father back to us, but he says we, we have been reconciled back to him from our rebellion back to the father of love. You see, this changes everything. It is a much older view of the atonement than the malarkey we hear today about a punitive God who is foremost judge rather than father. George MacDonald said he would never do as a judge what he would not first and foremost do as a father. We must jettison this wrong-headed idea that hell is God's vindictive punishment of sinners. You know, it was said that when Martin Luther looked at heaven, hell, and purgatory, he decided to throw away the wrong one. But nevertheless, even Luther says, God forbid that I should limit the time of acquiring faith to the present life. In the depth of the divine mercy, there may be opportunity to win it in the future. Indeed. But a purgative view of hell must not be viewed as salvation by torture. Rather, it's the very love of Christ that demands full liberation of his flock. And in a sense, it is his non-coercive way of allowing us to face consequences only for the sake of removing the cancer of sin and death itself. The gospel itself is the fullness of death to the old man, bringing life to the new. So this flame is nothing less than the one gospel reality breaking in upon us. This fire is not some addition to the gospel that was left undone on the cross, but the full unveiling and making concrete His very own holiness in us. Paul speaks of the judgment when the wood, hay, and stubble of our lives are burned up so that the gold, silver, and precious stones of the divine image in us comes forth. Or as George MacDonald says, the very fire of hell is the fire of love, but it's a love that will burn the evil out of you. Now, we're going to dive more into George MacDonald 
and his vision of this consuming fire in our next session. But when we get into the book of uh, Revelation and the lake of fire and the second death and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's going to become a little more clear. But, but let's look at this idea of uh, punishment. Is God punishing us per se or actually destroying the thing that destroys us? MacDonald writes, I do not believe that mere punishment exists anywhere in the economy of the highest. I think mere punishment, a human idea, not a divine one. But the consuming fire is more terrible than any punishment invented by riotous and cruel imagination. Punishment indeed it is, not mere punishment. A power of God for His creature. Love is God's being. Love is His creative energy. They are one. God's punishments are for the casting out of the sin that uncreates and for the recreating of the things His love made and sin has unmade. McDonald says, Love loves unto purity. Love has ever in view the absolute loveliness of that which it beholds. Therefore, all that is not beautiful in the Beloved, all that comes between and is not of love's kind, must be destroyed. And our God is a consuming fire. And now, bring it back to Isaac of Nineveh again, one of the greatest fathers. He says, If we said or thought that what concerns Gehenna is not in fact full of love and mixed with compassion, it would be an opinion tainted with blasphemy and abuse at our Lord God. If we even say that He will hand us to the fire in order to have us suffer, to torment us, and for every sort of evil, we ascribe to the divine nature hostility toward the rational creatures that God has created through grace. The same is the case if we state that God acts or thinks out of retribution, as though the Godhead wanted to avenge itself. Among all God's actions, there is none that is not entirely dictated by mercy, love, and compassion. This is the beginning and the end of God's attitude towards us. My friends, this flame is for us. It is the bliss of the saints. The true self is not consumed. It's like the burning bush of Moses. It is Christ blazing with the light of transfiguration on Mount Tabor, but His human body is not consumed. God's presence doesn't just obliterate us into nothing. Humanity is designed for theosis, to be deified by His presence, to be filled and fully aflame with God, to partake of the divine nature. God's glory upon us cleanses, but it does not nuke you to smithereens like Hiroshima. Cyril of Alexandria said, Just as the burning bush was not consumed by the fiery presence of God, so the humanity of Christ is not consumed by His deity. And therefore, guys, we are vicariously brought into God's presence in Jesus so we don't vanish into smoke. You are on fire with God right now. You don't even know it. No one is downplaying the severity of this fire, and we do indeed warn of it, but it is corrective. Your understanding of the nature of hell will be conditioned by the nature of the God you preach. What motivated Paul's ministry? The fear of hell compels us? or the love of Christ compels us. Jesus says you forgive someone, you dump coals of fire on their head. Mercy itself gets experienced as coals of fire on the heads of those who refuse to embrace it, clinging to their shame, their guilt, their remorse. You see, we've had wrath totally wrong. God doesn't hate on some days and love on other days. God is love. Even His wrath is a hot extension of His love. It is a big fat no against the sinfulness, the disease that destroys His children. Whether Paul is quoting his opponent or speaking for himself in Romans 1, it is correct to say God's wrath is not against us, but against ungodliness itself, against the sin that destroys His beloved. His wrath is a facet of His fatherly, corrective, restorative love that is for us. 
All of creation exists within the fabric of who God is. No part of creation came into existence behind His back. In Him all things hold together, Colossians 1. Paul tells the pagans in Acts 17, In Him we live and move and have our being. No one and nothing exists outside of God. The problem is that we exist deluded within God, blinded to the one who is the very ground of our existence. Nothing exists outside of Mr. Existence. David says in Psalm 139, if I go to the depths of hell, ha, ah, there you are. You think hell is separation from God? No one gets that much privacy. Bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do when he comes for you? He's everywhere. God's love is inescapable. It is His very presence that many want to avoid, but they can't when they cry out, let the rocks cover us and hide us from His presence. But you can't stop His flame of love from pursuing you. The idea of hell as separation from God is absurd. Revelation 14.10 says the damned are tormented in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. Uh, with brimstone, in fact. You know, sulfur, we're, we're going to see later, is a byproduct of purifying gold. But they aren't tormented because Jesus is roasting them for entertainment on a rotisserie for his nar narcissistic glory. Their torment is because they haven't yet embraced love. In context in this passage, they refuse to stop worshiping the beast. And the chief beastly image is our own idolatrous view of an angry God. A lamb who we envision as being beast-like. A God of empire, power, retribution, and control. Rather than the true God of humility and other giving sacrificial love displayed in Jesus. Anyway, like clockwork. People are going to point to two passages when they try to argue hell as being separation from God. And the first is usually 2 Thessalonians 1.9. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Well, guys, I hate to tell you, but this is a real easy one to debunk because that is a blatant mistranslation. Not just the fact that eternal is not necessarily eternal here, Ionios, we'll get to that later, but so many Bible versions get the crux of this thing wrong. The King James actually gets it right. The word shut out from is apo in Greek. And apo just means from. The fire comes from his presence. It doesn't shut us out from his presence. Just a few verses earlier, we have this exact same word in this chapter. It says grace is apo from Jesus Christ. Does grace shut us out from Jesus Christ? Of course not. Same exact word. Okay, this verse actually proves my point. The fire of love comes from God because it is God. It is the very fire that destroys everything within us that is not of love's kind. And it is for uh, our deliverance. <laughs> it is the eternal love of the Father. Now, there are plenty of other passages that people want to discuss to try to prove the eternality of hell, right? The sheep and the goats, etc. And I'm going to give adequate time to all of those in a future session. But right now, we're just addressing this misconception of hell as being separation from God, okay? So the second passage people mention is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know, where's this chasm or this gulf exist between the rich man and Abraham's bosom? Well, for starters, uh, that's a parable. I don't think anybody is literally in Abraham's bosom, right? Metaphors aren't literal. They're symbolic, pointing to greater conceptual realities. In other words, none of this is particularly spatial in terms of a literal gulf. But notice, uh, there's a chasm, but the gospel is still being preached across the chasm. And secondly, the rich man is there just because he refuses to get with the program. He's still trying to control, to boss around Lazarus the way that he did in life, running him out on evangelistic errands to his brothers. And the passage says they wouldn't believe even if the man was raised from the dead. So at the end of the day, 
is still just a simple refusal of the gospel that's being articulated here as to why he's in this condition. But nothing says this state is eternal. It indicates no literal spatial separation from God's fire of love. In fact, the flames seem to be dehydrating him. What will this thirsty rich man who longs for a drop of water on a finger to touch his tongue, what will he do when he hears the spirit and the bride's invitation in Revelation 22 to come? drink freely of the waters of life when he sees that the doors of the new Jerusalem are always open. How does he respond to Isaiah's invitation in chapter 55 to come all you who are thirsty come to the waters? Or in John 7 on the last and most important day of the feast, eschatological, when Jesus cries out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. This is an eschatological invitation, an eternal offer. The invitation stands open forever. All of this is a far cry from the eternal conscious torment view of hell. That God revives your muscles, your sinews, your emotions, and then over and over burns you consciously forever in retribution. That is not the only version of hell on the market. That, in fact, is a perversion. Now, we're going to go further with this next week. But remember, God is not literally a fire any more than he is literally a farm animal, literally a lamb, literally a rock, literally a cat, a lion. We're using metaphoric human language in Scripture to describe ineffable realities. The fire is not an exothermic chemical reaction. It's the flame of love, something any sane person would never want extinguished. And the goal of the Trinity is not merely to save us from the corruption of sin and death, but to bring us into full immortality, to make us divine. The early fathers knew that the gospel was all about our theosis, our deification. As Irenaeus and Athanasius said, God became man that men would become God. This doesn't mean we lose our humanity or our distinct personhood. After all, we serve a human God. We're talking about a deified, glorified humanity. But we will so identify with him in our theosis that Paul says that truly God will be all in all. And this is all throughout the church fathers from Dionysius to Maximus the Confessor. And the language origin gives that stuck for centuries was the image of iron in a fire. Iron maintains its own distinctive properties. It's still iron, just as our humanity will always be humanity. But as the iron glows hot in the fire, it also most truly becomes fire, taking into itself the properties of the fire. And this is our partaking of the divine nature. And this is God's plan for the entire cosmos, God becoming all in all. He achieved our theosis, our deification in Christ's own incarnation. And he's making it manifest by the fiery love of Holy Spirit, again, conforming us to Christ. And as David Bentley Hart notes rightly, the truth is the fire of hell is the fire of theosis. Hell isn't a place out there. Hell is theosis. It's just theosis in its most difficult and problematic aspect for those who seek to resist it. But it is theosis at the end of the day. God's final judgment is not about vendetta or retribution. It is restoration. Now, before we go, I should probably mention this as well. Another popular view is called annihilationism or conditionalism. That God either just wipes out... Uh, destroys everyone who is not a believer, um, or else they just never become immortal to begin with at the resurrection. Maybe they don't get resurrected, okay? They just never get eternal life, period. It's conditional upon whether people receive Christ. Okay, now, there's some truth in this because our false self, our sinful self, is indeed annihilated. So every verse that an annihilation is used could easily be explained in this. So we, we have to hold both Paul's destruction language and his universal language in tension. Now, Paul never talks about eternal torment, but there is destruction language. 
Now, I have never been a conditionalist. God is not a mass murderer. But I must always base everything on Christology, not just stringing together Bible verses. And that's how so many people do it. The divine image in mankind, the Imago Dei, is the Imago Christi. We're talking about the indestructible seed of the Logos, Jesus Christ himself in humanity. The immortal seed, which is the image of Jesus, which is not acquired by our faith, but bestowed by the grace of his incarnation. So conditionalism, you know, it's, it's not some humane mercy killing. It's morally reprehensible and beneath the divine virtue denying the fatherhood and familial nature of the triune God. Plus, it just once again falls back to a Pelagian soteriology. In other words, you become immortal, you become saved by your choice, your decision, your faith instead of His. And we'll get into this free will stuff later in, in, a, in a future session because I already hear people's bolts popping right now. God's not forcing anyone to be saved. Okay, right. A great, competent, and devoted father who respects his children's will so much that he lets them broil in agony forever or zaps them out of existence like old Yeller in the woods. Someone should probably call Child Protective Services. Anyway, I reject annihilationism just, you know, not because of some inherent immortality of the human soul itself, but moreover, the immortality of Christ, who is imaged in humanity, and the irrevocable love of the Father, and the redeeming genius of the Holy Spirit. Some folks just forget God looks like Jesus, or that God is Trinity, a relation of other giving love. George MacDonald said, Annihilation itself is no death to evil. Only good, where evil was, is evil dead. An evil thing must live with its evil until it chooses to be good. And that alone is the slaying of evil. All of these afterlife philosophies that don't hold to a final apocatosis, an ultimate restoration of all things, they're not only non-Christological, they are just philosophies, but they are a horrific tragedy and a tale of an incompetent, morally depraved creator. And you're going to need a men in black mind memory wipe to forget your Aunt Thelma was incinerated or is presently getting deep fried in hell whilst you dine at the Supper of the Lamb with a smile on your face. It's dehumanizing, and such a vision is not only not divine, it is subhuman. I think we have better news than that. A better, more capable father. And I happen to think that the gospel's true. I'm coming to Redding, California later this year. It's my only event on the West Coast. Plus, don't miss our Holy Spirit weekend on the Emerald Coast of Florida later this summer with Baxter Kruger, Rod Williams, and Warren Sylvester. And I'll be in the Midwest in Springfield, Ohio in December. Also, all of you New Englanders need to come out for my only event in the region. I'm coming to Massachusetts this fall. Plus, my only European stops, I'm going to be together with Baxter Kruger in Germany, followed by a fun weekend in Basel, Switzerland. And finally, plan to join us on the mission field, bringing the party to the poorest of the poor in the Philippines. Register for our Philippines Joy Mission by this October. The trip is actually in 2025. you got time to plan. Come join us. You can find all of these events and more by visiting johncrowder.net slash events. Also, check out our extended e-courses for a deeper dive into various topics, such as Intro to Christology, Sacred Mystery, a course on contemplation, Drunk Church History walks through 30 hours of fun, colorful stories to expand your understanding of the past. Plus, there's our radically grace-oriented course on the book of Revelation. All of these are available only at johncrowder.net slash courses. Check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum, at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give live, full-length lectures, interactive Q&A sessions. Plus, you have hundreds of hours of archived teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So it's a win-win.
Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co.